Hello good people, Emmanuel Sanyu Safali bringing you a very special episode of the Promise Insurance Show. And this time round, we are talking about uh, the history of insurance. Just like we have just been celebrating 60 years of Uganda's independence. And uh, people have been talking about the political history, uh, things that have transitioned over time. I figured that this time round, let's talk about also the history of insurance how it has come, how it has grown over time. Because I've noticed in our industry, many players just come and sell the products without telling you actually how it all started. And you, the clients, actually sometimes don't relate so well because uh, you think we're just out there for your money, not forgetting that risk management began as uh, communities coming together, you know, forming solidarities. And these are the things that we're going to see in these uh, coming episodes. Then from solidarities and communities coming together to you know, contribute for their insurances or for their challenges that may happen to them, they went to gambling. People would gamble. And that is why even up to now people believe that we are still gamblers. Insurers are like gamblers. But actually it transitioned from gambling to calculation. Now we shall see how the mathematicians of the time looked at the calculations. Then finally we shall look at the birth of uh, modern insurance. I believe when you watch all this episode, uh, it's a little bit long, yeah that's my disclaimer, but you will actually gain an appreciation of where we have come from and get the confidence that indeed insurers are in it for the long haul and they will actually service whatever challenges you may have because it has grown over time. Keep tuned uh also subscribe and give any comments in the channel below and also on the tv uh keep mentioning people please tune in thank you i must make a disclaimer yes it's quite a bit long it has some technical terms that i'll try to simplify for the layman's language and if need be we shall even do a local language uh, production but for now you can always uh, track more details on the blog which i'm going to go through today uh, this is the blog uh, browser that i use is called the blogger but i will also share with you the links for those who will be interested uh, so that you really understand um, how the insurance companies do it to transfer your risks, huge risks uh, worth billions of monies and then how much they're going to charge you in premiums you wonder how does it work so let's first show you how it was developed and then you can appreciate how it's being done today and we shall know how the future is going to roll out going forward so a total of 4,613 billion US dollars were collected globally on insurance in 2012. Modern life can hardly be imagined without this form of risk protection, and yet comparatively little is known about the history of the industry. Although it has played a major part in shaping today's in society and, and uh, culture, industrialization, welfare, innovation, economic development or modernization per se would not have been the same without private insurance. Since the 18th century, building insurance on solidarity, business acumen and the logic of calculation has proved an almost unbeatable business idea. It was to conquer the world over the next centuries. Trade and immigration became the two most important enablers for creating a global insurance safety net network. As every history, that of insurance has been exposed to challenges. Many were inherent to the industry. Some large catastrophes proved too big to deal with for some companies. From the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 to Hurricane Bestie in 1965 or the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001, the industry had to cope with unexpected enormous losses. But the challenges also came from the economy and its recurring crises, which at times caused bigger losses than the worst insured catastrophes. Also, monetary issues caused difficulties with fluctuating exchange rates and fluctuating interest rates. But overall, the 
insurance industry has proved remarkably resilient to all these challenges. Even in the recent crisis, insurance was less affected than other industries. A long history of prudent reserving and risk awareness had taught insurance, insurers to act cautiously. In antiquity, antiquity means in the past, risk was often seen through the lens of fate and met with acceptable with acceptance rather than defiance. Protecting against misfortunes was perceived as tantamount to interfering with divine providence. Yeah, can you imagine? Back then, people used to think that, ah, no, once something bad happens, the gods are not with you. For millennia, prayers, pilgrimages, and donations are performed insurance premiums. Indeed, as late as the 19th century, insuring against death was likely to arouse controversy among the clerics. But there were acceptable ways of alleviating losses, such as sharing premiums within social and business communities. Risk mitigation based on solidarity was widespread among guilds, trade associations, and village communities. Yes, and even this um, also happened uh, in my own life at the school where I studied from, secondary school, that was at Max and Mary's College, Sobi, from the year 2000-2005. We used to collect, we used to have what we called uh, trust funds, um, whereby all of us as students uh, would collect some little money from our pocket money to contribute to the people whose um, parents had failed to pay the school fees. And this became uh, gave us a very strong bond to really see that all of us finish school at the same time. Okay, let's look at uh, the most seafaring nation distributed cargo onto different ships to hedge against storms and pirates, while fraternal organizations provided ex post and thus morally accepted forms of solidarity. Ex post means um, based on these are collections or uh, ways of getting premiums whenever an incident happens rather than getting it before it happens. So it's not based on forecasts, it's based on actual. Whenever the actual incident happens, that is when they collect the premiums or the mavugos or everything like that. But uh, let's look into more uh, of uh, this interesting history so that we can really appreciate and then, most uh, spreading risk in such a way had its limits. However, and as a business model, it faced many difficulties. Ship owners sailing the same route would often experience accumulated losses, as would often certain communities, such as mine workers. A single disaster could far exceed the capacity of a barrio club, you know, like the Kwezika, the Harambe, Monomukari. Zimbe, ETC as referred in the African setting. Also, early forms of mutual insurance whereby premiums were paid ex ante. Ex ante means based on uh, forecasts and uh, not on um, actuals. So meaning, whenever you can forecast and see, you can predict or basing on any trend and calculations that you shall see by the earlier mathematicians of the day. We, they would forecast and say that, no, let's not uh, just collect people whenever an incident happens. No, let's pro predict from the trends, from the ships that were going on uh, sea. And um, for, for, for that matter, even uh, colonization and, uh, you know, piracy would not have really gone on had there not been insurance, you know. So whenever those things happened, uh, they would forecast and then they collect premiums. However, also this lacked a sophistication of modern enterprises. Operating costs had to be financed out of members' contributions and hardly any such society were, had ways to invest the capital professionally. For modern insurers, spreading risk and managing finances was become vital. Wow, we have listened to the how different uh, cultures were looking at insurance we are looking at how people were believing so much in prayers and faith. They are actually very primitive, but the clever ones actually formed solidarities and they started marine insurance. And, um, but then there are 
it did not really develop well until calculations came in because we, we had lots of gambling, the protein schemes, and that is what we're going to listen in to. How it developed from those kind of gambling schemes to calculations. Mathematicians came and started calculating. One more element, however, was to be at least as influential. In 1655, the French nobleman, Chevalier de Mer, was vexed by uncertainties in his gambling pastime. He wanted to know what the chances of rolling a six in a certain sequence were. The mathematicians Blaise Pascal and uh, Pierre de Montfort used an old pyramid of numbers and eventually were able to prove that a mathematical probability could be determined. This triggered a revolution in the development of probability theories and mathematicians all over Europe cooperated and applied their findings to calculate life expectancy. This attempt at predicting the future was in direct opposition to church doctrine, but ironically it was the church whose mortality tables provided some of the input used in those early probability calculations. You can imagine the church had uh, mortality tables. Mortality tables in Uganda have just been proved, um, given a, a go ahead in 2021, end of 2021, and operation of 2022. So you can imagine these people how far back they thought about the things and uh, they became a benchmark of the life insurance that we see today. Okay. Um, mortality tables were often the work of clerics who wanted to discover the role and plans of the divine creator and prove the, regular, the, the clear regularities uh, and the divine order behind the apparent randomness of mortality. Life insurance was slow to adopt the new science. Various forms of annuities prevailed, resembling gambling rather than assurance. For some time, the so-called Totin schemes named after their creator Lorenzo Totin had employed great success, especially in Italy and France. Subscribers could buy a share in a kind of life annuity based on the mortality of an appointed nominee. With nominees grouped by age range, interest was shared out and paid to subscribers annually. When a nominee died, the associated subscribers share in the annuity became void and the remaining subscribers within the age range received an increased share of interest. <laughs> Interesting, we have seen some of these schemes even now but uh, they were not sustainable. Uh, many totin schemes uh, were fraudulent and badly undersubscribed and eventually were turned into simple life annuities. It was only later in the 18th century that life insurance was put on a healthier footing. James Donson, a 45-year-old English mathematician, was refused insurance because of his advanced age. This annoyed him so much that he searched for a mathematical solution in order to form a more equitable base upon which to calculate premiums as a percentage of life expectancy. This principle was to be adopted by the English Equitable Life Assurance Society in 1766. On this basis, the Welshman Richard Price later developed a cost and modeling uh, model. And uh, in 1774, he calculated probability in life assurance or the equitable life based on current and expected mortality so that the current state of the operations could be assessed more precisely. From then on, life insurance no longer relied on speculation, but on calculations. So let's look at an example of, um, um, this was the Manchester United, this is like some kind of, uh, um, let's look at how, what it was called, uh, to be precise. This was the Friendly or Benevolent Societies, also called Fraternal Organizations, had a long tradition in many European countries. Before modern insurance, such organizations would provide insurance often for people with similar working background. With the advent of modern insurance, the welfare state, many of these mutual organizations went out of business. So these were some of the mutual organizations. They will give you a certificate to show you that you're insured for that time, but also based on some calculations. 
We also have members of the fire society were obliged to help each other to secure goods from burning houses of fellow members. The societies had their own firefighting equipment. Some of them gradually started collecting money for those affected by the fire and eventually turned into mutual fire insurance companies. The age of reason or enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries provided the grounds of accepting actuarial science as a rational means of con to conduct better business. Insurance and especially life insurance resonated with the search for laws, the statistical recording of natural events and the calculations of future developments. Behind this innovation was the conviction that the world and its possible future states could be predicted and computed. So, uh, actuary science is actually basically about uh, forecasting, um, predicting, rather than accounting, which is based on you know past records. You know, but we need both uh, to uh, to come up with those kind of modelings. So this is the Pascal's triangle. This was used by the Swiss mathematician Jacob Benel, who contributed the law of large numbers to actuarial science. This was to become the axiom from which life insurers could calculate expected losses. So, all right, uh, you have heard from the mathematicians De Montfort. You have heard from uh, Pascal uh, Blaise Pascal. You have heard from all those. Uh, mathematicians who actually led to the birth of modern insurance. So now let's look at how the actuaries also came into the picture and uh, they developed equity tables from the mortality tables for the priests at the time who actually developed all these mortality tables. So that would gain a very good appreciation of where we started from over 200 years ago to where we are right now. Insurance was thus an ideal laboratory for enlightened business ideas. The process of collecting different types of institutional and personal information and using underwriting to transform it to into quantifiable costs was important. And that is what is still being done after now. It created a vital counterbalance to the new and potentially destabilizing forces that were transforming the division of labor urbanization, and economies of trade. Insurance also helped money become the means of communication within the economy and contributed to more and more problems being expressed in terms of costs and time. Not all cultures adopted such thinking from the start, though. In Southern Europe, it took a catastrophe to change the perception of risk and views on destiny. The Great Lisbon Earthquake in 1755 challenged traditional interpretation of divine omnipotence. Almost the entire city was destroyed, including churches, municipal buildings, but much to the concern of many survivors, the red light district was left intact. The red light district is well known for prostitutes and all that kind of um, dirty business. You can imagine, ironically, that one was left intact while well, the bigger uh, churches and uh, buildings were all destroyed by the earthquake. How could a benevolent God allow this? And why did an all-powerful God not prevent it? Was mankind really to take destiny into its own hands? Rational thinkers were increasingly seen to be on the winning side of the argument. And although the earthquake did not immediately boost the idea of insurance in the South, it gave rise to modern seismology. Seismology is now the study of really earthquakes. So people really had to go into such deep thinking. Uh, whenever these incidents would happen, they really go and question. Rather than say it's just God, you really go back and look at the trends and study and monitor and track. And all those studies would not have been possible without the uh, help of insurance. And even today, much as Africa, we are blessed that we don't have such natural disasters uh, in uh, the Western countries, the European and uh, Americas, they have this on a, on a yearly basis. So insurance is a must. 
and not to say that we, we don't also develop the same attitude, let's also develop the same culture because that's the only way you can develop. You can't develop without taking risk into consideration. This is Blaise Pasco as, as a 12 year old together with Pierre de Montfort. He later developed the basis for probability calculations which were to have a lasting impact on life insurance. Okay, let's look at in England. It was the, uh, the Great Fire of London in 1666 which changed public opinion. Hardly any of the 70,000 destroyed homes were insured. One Londoner, Nicholas Babon, made a fortune out of rebuilding the city and then turned into insuring the houses. His main motive was, to, was not solidarity but business, pure and simple. His rational approach and his experience as a banker and a mortgage provider made him realize that his insurance company needed to be built on a different financial foundation. And so in 1681, he created the first known joint stock insurance company. Shareholding was to become essential for modern insurance as it allowed the separation of operating capital from risk capital and provided funds to expand business into new lines and beyond the home market. And this is going to actually be a basis to find out from other, our local insurance companies and their founding. And as you see through this history, you shall see that they are, it has also uh, influenced how the local insurance companies are working to this day. So this is the old sugar house in Hull, had been set up to compete with London refineries. Uh, but was abandoned in 1840s. In 1868, it collapsed, killing eight men and boys. Sugar had become an important catalyst for industry growth in England. Refining of the raw sugar at plants in Europe was associated with considerable fire risk. In the second half of the 18th century, fires at the sugar refineries accounted for a large proportion of all bankruptcies in England. Only two of the fire insurance companies at the time also insured sugar refineries, albeit at uninflated uh, rates and with mega policy limits. In 1782, 84 sugar refinery owners in London founded a joint stock insurance company called the Phoenix, they were the first ones to specialize in insuring large industrial risks. And on the trail of sugar to deliberately export this modern form of insurance. So you can see even uh, sugar business and also bring the story of uh, colonization and slavery. Uh, for it to come into Africa, these guys had already seen that it was almost next to impossible to have these factories in the UK and thus they had to do it uh, in their countries that they came to colonize. But let's look at all these others. The immediate success of such joint stock corporations was however to uh, dealt a significant blow as it led to speculation and subsequent ruin as happened in the South Sea Bubble in 1720. The rational business ideas of the Enlightenment also attempted, also tempted many investors to abuse the sound principles of insurance to bet on the most unlikely risks such as the outcomes of wars, the danger of dying from excessive consumption of gin, or the death of birth of heirs to empires. The government subsequently banned some forms of insurance. A ban on insurance had already come into force in 1746. Still, it seemed there was an alternate and inevitable logic in developing insurance further. The economist Adam Smith praised it as a rational invasion and even a moral obligation. Not to insure oneself, he considered a thoughtless rashness and presumptuous contempt of the risk. Let's look at uh, the Great Fire through London uh, from say, 2nd to 5th September in 1766. It destroyed over 70,000 homes, although only six deaths were recorded. 
it did not take long for the first fire insurance company to be established after the catastrophe. Uh, that's the Phoenix emblem with the monuments of the Great Fire of London in the background. The Phoenix managers were the first to venture out beyond the borders of their own country. With agencies, along with the new joint stock marine insurance companies and the Lloyds of London, they were among the first to respond to the rapid increase in the interdependency of the global economy and that had been underway since the middle of the 18th century. The Industrial Revolution and the growth of the empire called for insurance solutions. Towards the end of the 18th century and the first truly uh, modern and global insurance company, the Phoenix was as founded uh, by association of sugar refinery associations in London. Soon after its foundation, it insured risks in distant countries and it was the first insurance company insurer to establish offices abroad. And so it was from Britain that the property and life insurance started colonizing the world based on modern science. New forms of capitalization and the possibility of risk, the possibility to spread risks across the globe. Although this was to prove an a virtually unbeatable business model, uh, you can see this was the Amsterdam exchange engraving by uh, Francois de Van Blaisvik in 1743. The Vinehoek uh, Ostagy Company, that's the Dutch East Indian Company in Amsterdam, established the oldest known stock exchange in 1602. For insurance, shareholding was to become an ideal way to raise operating capital which allowed them to expand their business. And as you know, those who follow some history, the Dutch became a very um, important place for development and also um, uh, developing economics. Now, uh, as I conclude this segment and of the show, uh, let's look at the 1755 Lisbon earthquake and tsunami. All these were natural catastrophes that really um, affected the way um, insurance was to change over the years. Wow, thank you so much for keeping attention for this long. It's not easy, uh, but this is a very interesting, very intriguing subject and something that I'm very passionate about because you can't know where you're going without knowing where you've come from. So I think you are, I hope you have gained something and a better appreciation of where I've come from. From the times of uh, communities coming together as solidarities to contribute for the losses that had happened using the ex post method of collecting premiums, that is whenever you collect premiums, whenever something happens, to the time of uh, ex ante when uh, you would actually forecast from the trends of how things have been moving, especially for the marine insurance, they would contribute premiums in, in advance such that when an incident happens, they can, ch they can always check it out. And then uh, from the time to calculations, the various mathematicians, uh, Blaise Pascal, there was uh, Pierre de Montfort, all these really contributed a lot to the development of modern insurance. And then lastly to the birth of modern insurance companies like the Phoenix, uh, which really started on the fire insurance. And uh, there's uh, Nicholas Babon. I hope you really in enjoyed this episode. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, this Promise Insurance Show. It airs on U24 TV every Sunday at 6 p.m. And uh, we have a repeat on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Uh, please re try to subscribe to the YouTube channels, both on U24 and also the Promise Insurance Show on YouTube. Send your comments, send your um, likes, and those who don't like, you can put any feedback so that we, we, we actually improve and we look at what kind of content you are looking out for. So, I remain Emmanuel Sanyi Safali, bring you the Promise Insurance Show. Until next time, I remind you to hope for the best while preparing for the worst. Keep tuned. <laughs>